towards the end of the of the of the uh, meeting, and and I'll say it again at the end for those that weren't here uh, for the beginning. Um, next week, for the final one of these of this series of lectures, uh, I'm very pleased to say that I'll have joining me uh, Dan Mary Dore, uh, former uh, Minister of Justice, Minister of Finance, Deputy Prime Minister, um, a very um, distinguished uh, Israeli political figure, and that'll be a, I think a great um, a great session which you won't want to miss. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with the uh, with the lecture for today. Um, as always, for those of you uh, who haven't been in the previous sessions, um, I'll be I'll be taking questions afterwards, and you can uh, you can write those questions in the chat box at the bottom of the screen, and I'll come to them uh, at the end. Okay, so let me just do a screen share here. Good. Okay, so um, for those of you who were here last week, you'll recall that after my own discussion on anti-Zionism, we heard from um, my guest, Michelle rojas Tal about the situation facing students on campus. And I wanna to talk today about two specific challenges to the legitimacy of Zionism, heard particularly on university campuses, um, but also from experts maybe I should say experts, um, in the opulent pages of certain newspapers, um, two challenges, each of which rests on a different false premise. And I'm gonna explain why, why they're false. So if we say that Zionism essentially, uh, uh, fundamentally, is the return of the Jewish people to active history, right? To being masters of their own faith, their return to politics in a large sense, politics with a capital P, to sovereignty, we can say that one of those, one of these challenges, one of these challenges to delegitimize Zionism refutes that there is even such a thing as a Jewish people deserving of sovereignty. And the other one I want to talk about looks to depict that return to history as nationalism in the worst sense of the word, right? Nationalism as racism, colonialism, or even fascism. So let's look at the first, at that first claim, right? Jews are not entitled to a nation state because quite simply they're not a nation, right? They're a religious community, not a national community. And you'll hear this time and again, um, the idea of a Jewish state or a state for the Jews is, is an absurd claim. How can one justify establishing a state purely for people of one religion? Now, as they define it, they have a point because there's nothing in international law or in the norms of states, certainly of democratic states, that would justify such a thing. However, that's not what Israel is, and that's not what Zionism was about. Zionism is a legitimate movement, and Israel, an entirely legitimate and normative nation state, because the Jews have always seen themselves as a people, Am Yisrael, right, the people of Israel. In modern terminology, we'd say a nation, but obviously the idea of nations and nation states is a more modern idea. Uh, and the problem we have, if we want to argue this, is that in the West in particular, we've been conditioned to think of Jews as a religious group, as a religious community synonymous with Christians and Muslims, right? We're all familiar with um, talk about the three Abrahamic faiths, for example. Um, and the reality is different. And it's actually obvious to anyone who's thought about the very fact of the many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Jews who observe very little of the religion and are often agnostic or even atheist and then compare that with Christianity or, is, or Islam and it doesn't work the, the, the analogy doesn't work a Christian by definition is someone who accepts a certain religious creed Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God you can't be an atheist Christian um, likewise a Muslim must accept that Allah is the one true God that the Quran is the literal word of God that the uh, that it was dictated to the last of, of, of of God's prophets, Muhammad. And to be Jewish is not necessarily to be a believer in the literal word of the Torah or to observe Jewish dietary laws or laws of Shabbat, or even to believe in, that, in the one true God of the Torah. These are religious beliefs and traditions of the Jewish nation, but to be Jewish is to be part of that nation. Uh, you don't lose your status as part of that nation if you don't observe those beliefs and traditions. This is not the same 
um, with Christianity and Islam. Um, let's explore a little bit of where that um, confusion comes from. The best book on the subject is, I think, by uh, Professor Princeton called Leora Batnitsky, and she wrote a book called How Judaism Became a Religion. And the title tells you a lot already, right? Today, Jews may think of their Jewishness as primarily religious or primarily cultural, or if Zionism is the dominant factor, then primarily national. Um, as Professor Batnitsky makes clear in her book, prior to modernity, she says, Judaism and Jewishness were all these at once, religion, culture, and nationality. So if you'd asked a Jew in the Middle Ages if he was Jewish by religion or part of the Jewish people, he wouldn't know what you were talking about. He wouldn't have understood the distinction you were making. To be a Jew was to be part of the Jewish people, and that meant that the religious customs you observed were those that Jews had always followed. In fact, there's no word for religion in ancient, he in, in ancient Hebrew. Right? The word that we use today in modern Hebrew, dat, or dati for religious, is a modern Hebrew word. Um, culture and religion were part of what, it, of what it was to be part of the Jewish people. Whether you lived in England or Spain or Egypt, these were the countries where you resided, right, where you lived. You weren't English or Spanish or Egyptian. You were Jewish. The concept of being a citizen of a state didn't emerge until the French Revolution, together with the, with the, with the whole idea of a nation state. Um, and in France, in revolutionary France, the new French authorities believed in the enlightenment ideas of, in, of individual rights and the equality of each person. But what about the Jews? Could a Jew also be a Frenchman in the, in the, uh, the brave new world that they had ushered in? And the answer was provided by a, a, a liberal noble from Paris called Stanislas de Clermont Tonnerre, who said the Jews should be denied everything as a nation, but granted everything as individuals. Right, they should have equal rights within France as citizens of the new uh, French Republic, but there was no room in this France for a separate nation, for a, for a separate national group. Um, David Ben-Gurion, who was among other things a keen scholar of European history, once wrote, the French Revolution gave the Jews the first impetus to emancipation and equality of rights, but this revolution demanded of Jewry the obliteration of its national character. He understood that modernity brought with it, yes, emancipation, of a, to a point, um, but also a shift in the Jewish self-definition, at least in Western Europe. And that was really the message for, for the emancipated Jews of Western Europe um, in that period of, of steady progress of equal rights and freedoms for European Jews over the next century. Jews who wanted to be recognized as Frenchmen or Englishmen or Germans had to speak of their Jewish identity as just a matter of religion. They were, in the famous phrase, um, Germans of the Mosaic persuasion, or, or basically Germans of the Jewish religion, just as their neighbors were Germans of the Protestant religion. Uh, so when Zionism started as a serious political movement at the end of the 19th century, it was not, as is claimed now, um, by anti-Zionists particularly, uh, the conjuring out of thin air of the idea of Jews as a nation. It was a return to what Jews had always seen themselves and been seen by others to be a particular people. Uh, yes, with a particular religious tradition, but also a specific history, a language, and a homeland. In the modern uh, parlance of the 18th and 19th centuries, the Jews were a nation. And it, it, what's problematic for someone in the 21st century to grasp is that a people who've existed for some 3,000 years, particularly a people who existed for 3,000 years, most of which not as a national group in a particular territory, um, doesn't easily fit into modern categories. So there is, of course, there was a Jewish religion. And yes, this religion is the religion of just one people, the Jews. But the Jews are the people, the nation, not just the religion. And as a nation with a particular historic homeland, they have a right to self-determination in that homeland, no less than do other stateless minorities with a clearly defined national identity based on land and language and history. Interestingly, this um, category error uh, is very much a Western phenomenon. Right? So where, where Judaism is, 
Judaism is seen as one of the three Abrahamic faiths, as I said, and so it's always grouped together with Christianity and Islam. If you look at the modern constitutions of non-Western countries, for example, those countries in Eastern Europe that became independent after the fall of communism, Jews are often listed as a national minority, right? So you have countries that have con new constitutions, they become democracies after, after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and um, they'll say, you know, at the beginning of the constitution, for example, the Czech Republic will say something like, this is the, <clears throat> the nation state of the Czechs, uh, as well as being the state of um, its non-Czech citizens, right? There are other, acknowledging there are other non-Czech people who live there who have equal rights in the democracy. And some of these countries actually list the national minorities. So Croatia, which became an independent state in the 1990s when Yugoslavia fell apart, um, has a constitution which states, Croatia is the national state of the Croatian people, and a state of members of other nations and minorities who are its citizens. And then it lists some examples. And it says, Serbs, Czechs, Slovaks, Hungarians, Italians, Jews, and some others. So not Jewish rather than Christian, Jewish rather than Hungarian or Italian, right? Jewish as a national, um, as a national group. Uh, these Eastern European countries didn't experience the enlightenment of Western Europe, and they never stopped thinking of Jews as a distinct people, not just as a religion. Uh, and this, um, this whole kind of myth, if you like, of Jews as just a religion also has a bearing on the prospects of peace, um, because what the Croatians understand, the Palestinians don't, or don't want to. Um, so Palestinian leaders, up to and including uh, Mahmoud Abbas, have refused to recognize Israel as a Jewish state because, quote, Jews are just a religion and religions don't have states. And this refusal has understandably provoked a lot of skepticism among the majority of Israelis about the seriousness of the Palestinian desire to reach genuine two-state agreements. If there's, not, if there's not even a recognition of the existence of the Jewish people, exactly what kind of um, two-state solution would be acceptable to them? Okay, now let's get to the second uh, charge uh, that Jewish nationalism, Zionism essentially, is inherently uh, a racist and oppressive idea. So I'll start with a general point about context. Um, and it's, it's, it's simply this, although nationalism today, perhaps increasingly today, um, is associated with, with very unpleasant ideas and, and regimes, when political Zionism began at the end of the 19th century, new nation states were being formed throughout Western and Central Europe, and nationalism was a profoundly progressive and liberal idea, right? It was a move, it was, it was an, it was a, it was an idea of liberation. Um, so if you look at um, what was happening at that time, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, it was about peoples and nations that were either fragmented, like the Italians, or under foreign rule like the Greeks or the Irish or the Poles, establishing the, for themselves the freedom to live according to their own traditions, with their own language, with their own national story as the historic backdrop to the country. And in this period, the great liberals and progressives of the time supported national self-determination, right? It was one of the great progressive ideas of the time. So the, the gentleman in the picture is the uh, President Woodrow Wilson of the United States, whose famous 14 points that he laid out at the end of the First World War was supposed to um, set some kind of framework for a post-war world that he believed would be more just um, and more peaceful. Uh, and it was basically all, uh, the, one of the points was that uh, the empires, the European empires, primarily in, in Africa and Asia, um, should be disbanded and that new nation states should be formed um, based around uh, the national identities of those people, right? The, the individual uh, national group should have their own, their own nation states. And then, then, of course, as the century progresses, we see the ugly variant of nationalism become dominant in certain countries. Obviously, most importantly, Italy in the 1920s, Germany in the 1930s, and then the rest is history. And much of the world, Europe in particular, ends the Second World War convinced that nationalism in and of itself is a bad thing. 
Um, and you can also trace the foundation of what became the European Union to, to that idea, I think, in part. Um, of course, Jews took from the Second World War a very different message, in fact, the opposite message. Um, they needed desperately to have their own nation state. They needed to have one place in the world where they would be a majority, where they could run their own affairs uh, and make their own decisions. Um, next week, I'm going to talk a bit more about nationalism more generally, but I want to say something more specific about Zionism that, in my view, really makes a complete mockery of the idea that Zionism is some kind of reactionary and oppressive um, ideology. And it's, it's this, from the very beginning, from the very beginning of political Zionism, the Zionist movement was uh, democratic and was liberal. I mean, uh, before I'm accused of being partisan, I don't mean liberal in the American political sense of liberal rather than conservative. I mean, big L liberal, right? As in liberal democracy, as in liberal principles that, are the, that we, we sort of see as part of the, as part of, um, the West uh, the sorts of things that are enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, freedom of expression, minority rights, regular elections, the rule of law, etc. Now, delegates at the pre-state Zionist Congresses were democratically elected, including, of course, from countries that weren't themselves democracies, like Tsarist Russia, for example. In fact, many countries in Europe that weren't democracies at the time, nevertheless, um, elected representatives to the Zionist Congresses. Women had full equality as voters and representatives um, at a time when, um, uh, at a time before women had the vote in the vast majority of democratic countries at the time. So uh, get an idea of context. Um, the first Zionist Congress is 1897. Um, the United States doesn't mandate equal voting rights for women um, at the state and federal level until 1920. In Britain, it wasn't until 1928 that women had the same full voting rights as men. Um, and if we want to think about what Herzl himself had in mind for the Jewish state that he wanted to build, of course, he never saw Israel. He died um, several decades before uh, Israel comes into being. But we know what he had in mind because he, he told us. He wrote a book. He wrote a novel, Alt Neuland. Uh, his somewhat utopian depiction of a Jewish state the Zionist movement would create. Uh, and in the story, um, a part of the story, there's an election. Uh, the, the main protagonist arrives actually in the country during an election. Um, the country is a democracy and all citizens have the vote, regardless of gender, race or religion. Again, interesting that he wrote this in 1902. Um, and this was the idea, right? This was, and he was writing this at a time when that was not the case. Uh, pretty much anywhere. Uh, in Herzl's fictional state, as in the real Israel, there's a substantial Arab minority who are citizens of the country. What happens in this election? I'm going to read uh, a, a few sentences from a book by um, Professor Shlomo Vineri uh, of Hebrew University, who wrote, who wrote a very good biography of Herzl, in which he focused quite a lot on Old Neuland, and he gives a very good description of this. So he's describing how the book depicts uh, this election. He says, a recently arrived immigrant has just established a new political party which calls for the disenfranchisement of its non-Jewish inhabitants. The leader of this racist party is a certain Dr. Geyer. Geyer maintains that citizenship and voting rights should be restricted to Jews in a Jewish state. The campaign becomes a battle for the country's soul. At the core of the novel, a dramatic accounts of election rallies in which the country's liberal establishment fights the racist challenges of Geyer and his followers. Eventually, Geyer's party is beaten, the liberals win, and the defeated candidate is reported to be leaving the country in ignominy." End quote. Right, that's in Herzl's depiction of the Jewish state of his imagining. The bad guy, the villain of the piece, is this racist candidate for election who wants to strip Arabs of their voting rights. It's worth remembering this, by the way, when you hear some far-right figures in contemporary Israeli politics who claim to be the true Zionists or the most ardent Zionists. And in Herzl's imagining the Jewish state, they're the bad guys. So Herzl's Zionism is liberal and democratic, and he sets a tone which is more or less followed throughout the Zionist movement. 
um, and the most authentically liberal of all the Zionist leaders who followed Herzl, um, and I'm not just saying this because I'm working at the Vega Center, but really the most authentically liberal of the most classically liberal was uh, Zev Jabotinsky. And it's his ideology of liberal nationalism that I think best defines how Zionism combines a particularist agenda, the collective national rights of the, um, of the Jewish people with an embrace of the universalist principles of liberal democracy. And I'm gonna be talking more about that specifically next week. Um, but let, if we can just take like a minute or two to read some of these quotes of Jabotinsky. So he says, the independent geographical nation state is best furthering the spiritual, economic, and social creativity of individuals. So he's, he's a nationalist of his time. He believes in the idea of a nation state. Um, uh, but in that nation state, this will be a nation state where, uh, of equal rights and where the individual is, in, is all important. Um, what does he say about equal rights? He says, it is better that I too depart from the world rather than acquiesce to the philosophy that my son and my fellow man's are not equal. And then he says something else, which I think is very interesting. Again, given that he's writing this, I think this is from the 1920s, um, where he says, democracy means freedom. Even a government of majority rule can negate freedom. These contradictions will have to be prevented. <clears throat> the Jewish state will have to be such, ensuring that the minority will not be rendered defenseless. Right, so he understands that in a democracy, he doesn't just believe in democracy in the classical sense of democracy, the democracy that we would take from, say, um, uh, ancient Rome, right, where it's, it's, it, where it's just about majority rule. He's talking about uh, what we now think of as a liberal democracy, where you also have institutions, um, not least uh, judiciary, but other institutions, checks and balances, that ensure that the minority are protected from um, tyranny of the majority, right? This is extremely um, progressive stuff. What we now think, think of as progressive stuff. Um, and this is, this is Zev Jabotinsky, right? This is the person that is seen um, at not least by anti-Zionists, if, if you start talking about Jabotinsky and they're informed enough to at least know the name. Um, they're gonna, they see him as like, you know, on the, the, the right or the far right of, of, uh, of Zionism or Israeli politics. Um, now, uh, Jabotinsky dies in 1940. Uh, he doesn't live to see the state. Um, but when the state is formed in 1948, um, we can see that this, this, this marriage of national identity with, with liberal values is summed up also in Israel's founding document in the Declaration of Independence, which does emphasize the justice and, and legitimacy of the Jewish claim to a state in its ancient homeland, but pointedly also includes the promise of full equality, right? So it says in this extract that I've translated here, the state of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration for the ingathering of the exiles, right? That's the, the basis, that's the raison d'etre of the state. Um, it will foster the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. It will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisaged by the prophets of Israel. So interestingly, it's not just saying uh, freedom, justice, and peace because these are modern, uh, enlightenment ideas. It's also making a reference to the, to the national story of the Jewish people, right, to the prophets of Israel. It will ensure complete equality, uh, social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. Now, we can argue the extent to which Israel has fulfilled this um, at different times, more rather than less, but the point is that the the founding ideals of the state, and indeed of Zionism, um, were far from the, as I say, the, uh, the sort of um, um, oppressive or, or reactionary nationalism that Zionism's critics um, put to it. So Israel was established in 1948 as a democracy um, at a time when uh, there's no more than 20 or so democracies in the entire world. Um, what's more, it's remained a democracy. Um, and historical context, I think, will help you realize how significant that is. Israel was established at a time when the European empires were tumbling down, and there were literally dozens and dozens of newly independent states emerging in the years immediately after the end of World War II, not just in Africa and Asia and the Middle East, but also in Europe as the borders were redrawn following the defeat of, uh, of Nazi Germany. And of all of these countries, and we are talking, as I said, 
literally dozens of them. How many were established as democracies then and have remained democracies from that day of establishment to today? The answer is two, Israel and India. And actually Indian democracy is in a lot of trouble at the moment, but that's another story. Um, so that's the history. Now, Israel today. Israel isn't perfect. I've said this before. It's, it's, it shouldn't need to be said because it's obvious um, that every country, um, rather than no country, is perfect. Israel makes mistakes. Um, it will no doubt make more. I have my own criticisms um, of the country, as does everyone who lives here, anyone who's taken a taxi in Israel um, and listened to the taxi driver talk about um, uh, what he thinks about the government of the day will know that um, the election that we uh, had relatively recently, um, hopefully the, the last election for a while, um, had the country pretty much split down the middle on, on, the, on, the, on the main question that the election was about, which was whether or not you want Benjamin Netanyahu as prime minister, right? You pretty much had half the country uh, voting yes for parties that did, that did want him as prime minister and half the, com the country voting for parties that did not. Um, uh, I expect some of you who are not Israeli citizens um, are not fans of your own current governments, or maybe you love the current president or prime minister and you couldn't stand the last one from a different party, and that's fine, that's normal, that's democracy. We like this leader and not that one. We like this party and not that one. Um, the difference in Israel, or the difference with Israel and the way Israel is discussed, um, is that it seems that Israel, uh, only Israel, is the target not just of criticisms of this or that government, but of its legitimacy. And we discussed that, or I discussed that some more last week. Um, let's do another comparison, um, just to make this clearer. Um, or let's, let's, actually, let's look at a, a current controversial issue in Israeli politics, right? This question of extending uh, sovereignty or annexing, depending on how you want to put it, parts of Judea and Samaria of the West Bank. Now, Someone can take a view highly critical of that uh, idea, and that's completely legitimate. Many Israelis, many Zionists are opposed to that idea. But it's quite a leap, both logically and morally, to go from criticism of that position to a demonization of Zionism itself. The Zionism itself, which as a, as a basic principle doesn't have anything specific to say about um, the settlement project, um, uh, to go from criticism of that to a call for Israel to disappear. Uh, that, they, that the idea of a Jewish state is illegitimate because you don't approve of the actions of the government. Uh, if we look at another comparison um, from uh, the, the most, uh, sort of most prominent democracy, the United States, um, there's, there was plenty of progressive opinion uh, that condemned, quite rightly condemned, the treatment of African Americans uh, in many states of America before, the, before uh, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act were passed in the 1960s. Um, but I doubt you would find um, calls by serious people writing in serious newspapers or speaking on university campuses for America to disappear uh, because it was a unique evil in the world because of the racism in, 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 the, in the Jim Crow states. That kind of move is reserved for Israel. And because it seems to be the only state that receives that kind of treatment, and it happens to be the world's only Jewish state, as I discussed last week, there is a word for that, and we, should, we shouldn't be shy of calling out and semitism when we see it. Um, I'm going to uh, just say a few, a few more things. Uh, one interesting thing about uh, this idea of Zionism as a, as a national liberation movement is that um, it can also be a model for other peoples, right? So Herzl clearly saw the potential for a Jewish state to contribute to the wider world and to be that kind of model. There's this extraordinary passage that he wrote um, <clears throat> uh, in, in, in 1902. Uh, he says, there's still one other question arising out of the disaster of nations which remains unsolved to this day and whose profound tragedy only a Jew can comprehend. This is the African question. Just call to mind all those terrible episodes of the slave trade, of human beings who merely because they were black 
were stolen like cattle, taken prisoner, captured and sold. Their children grew up in strange lands, the objects of contempt and hostility because their complexions were different. I'm not ashamed to say, though I may expose myself to ridicule for saying so, that once I've witnessed the redemption of the Jews, my people, I wish also to assist in the redemption of the Africans. Um, very interesting. Uh, and, and actually his words were not in vain because he, um, he was, a, he was uh, particularly influential for Golda Meir, who was, uh, before she was prime minister, was foreign minister in the 1950s. And she admitted to being inspired by these words. She wrote this in her autobiography, that when she was foreign minister, she established a department within the foreign ministry, which still exists, called Mashav, uh, which is about international development uh, in um, poorer parts of the world, in less developed parts of the world. And she wrote in her autobiography, independence has come to us as it was coming to Africa, not served up on a silver platter, but after years of struggle. Like them, we had shaken off foreign rule. Like them, we had to learn for ourselves how to reclaim the land. We Jews share with the African peoples a memory of centuries long suffering. For both Jews and Africans alike, such expressions as discrimination, oppression and slavery, these are not mere catchwords. They don't refer to experiences of hundreds of years ago. They refer to the torment and degradation we suffered yesterday and today. And it's something else to think about, I think, when we're told that Zionism equals racism, especially when, as is unfortunately the case today, and actually very much today with what's going on in the United States at the moment, um, that this view of Zionism as racism is used to drive a wedge between Jewish and black communities. I want to make one final point. Um, uh, something else we need to be careful of is a, is a newer uh, phenomena. Um, we're used to our enemies, mainly found on the left, denouncing Zionism as racism. What is new uh, in the last uh, few years is that some figures on the far right uh, profess their support for Zionism. So, for example, you have in the United States, white nationalists, people like uh, Richard Spencer and others expressing their admiration for Zionism. Um, the former foreign minister of Austria, um, who's from a party that until very recently had a lot of very good things to say about Hitler, um, also said very nice things about Zionism. And the problem here is that they're, I, I think like the left, they're also saying Zionism is racism. It's just that they mean it's a positive. Um, they mean that, that they, both of these groups, both the far left and the far right, are claiming that Zionism is, is similar to white nationalism, is an exclusivist and anti-liberal type of nationalism. And that's not the case, as I, as, I, as I hope I've made clear. Authentic traditional Zionism was not that. Um, and if I, again, uh, I take you back to the Declaration of Independence and to Herzl's vision of a Jewish state and to Old Neuland, and from the beginning, Zionism brought together the values of Jewish civilization with what we would now call liberal democracy. And that the racism and bigotry of the far right should be anathema to Zionists. Um, there was actually a question last week. I'm not sure if the gentleman who asked it is, is on the, the meeting this week, but he actually asked a question about, about what we do with, with friends, of, friends, of, friends of Israel, people who are supportive to Israel, but who might have some, uh, shall we say, dodgy views about um about race and uh, and maybe jews themselves um okay to conclude and sum up uh zionism is the ideology the political movement supported the return of the jewish people to history the restoration of jewish sovereignty meaning the ability of the jewish people to make their own national decisions to defend and secure themselves not to be dependent on the goodwill of others particularly important as throughout jewish history that goodwill has often been in short supply. Uh, Anti-Zionists, whether Palestinian and therefore directly involved in the conflict or just uh, Israel haters in the West, pro-Palestinians, who are usually not so much pro-Palestinians as anti-Israel, um, often base their critique around one of two claims. One, that the Jews are not a people or a nation, they're just a religion, they don't deserve a state. Um, and two, that Jewish nationalism is like many forms of nationalism, indistinguishable from racism or colonialism. And what I've tried to do is show how both of these arguments are based on, on fallacies and rely on ignorance of the weight of evidence disproving them. Uh, the Jews have always historically seen themselves as a people. 
and Zionism was not only part of that wave of liberal nationalisms of the period, but more than that, it succeeded far beyond most of them in establishing a flourishing democratic nation state. Okay, I'm gonna end there. I'm gonna stop the screen sharing, and I'm gonna see if we have some questions. Um, uh, oh, I see David Behrens is there, who asked the question last time. Hi, David. Um, okay, so I, I, there's, there's not a question as such. Someone mentions the Islamic Republic of Iran. Very interesting, yes, yeah, so it's a good point. So um, Iran isn't the only country actually that defines itself in that way. Pakistan also formally defines itself as, Islamic as an Islamic state. Um, uh, Turkey doesn't, but is moving in that direction under Erdogan. Um, so yeah, these are, these, these, are, these are countries that are defining themselves as Islamic in the religious sense. They're not making any claims um, that Islam is national, except in the wider sense of Islam as a kind of empire, right? As, a, as, a, as the Ummah. Um, but that's something very different, right? That's an expansionist idea that's that's also talking about um uh, some level certainly in the case of iran um uh, as a sort of conquest uh conquest based idea um or conversion of course or living uh, living as, as second class citizens under islam um uh, does anyone have any other questions or points based on what i on what i said otherwise this is just going to finish early which is fine, because I'm tired. But um, but um, <laughs> but I'm also happy to answer answer any questions. No questions. Okay. So um, uh, I hope that was interesting. Oh, we have a question from Melvin. Thank you, Melvin, from Melvin Lippich. How do you reconcile the fact that the Palestinians don't identify Jews as a nation, but contrary to their claims, there was no national identity until the '60s? I assume you mean their national identity. I assume you mean that. Right. It's a very good point. So, so here's the interesting thing, right, that you'll hear from the same people who claim that um, Zionism um, is not legitimate because the Jews are not a nation, uh, will say the Palestinians uh, are a nation. And if you point out, if you dare to point out, that Palestinian nationalism or Palestinian national identity is a relatively recent um, idea, right? You can either um, you can either trace it back to the 1960s after the Six Day War, when um, the PLO actually became a movement of the Palestinians and not just a movement of the Arab League, um, which, which it was really established as in '64. Um, uh, or you can maybe, if you want to be more generous, you could talk about uh, some kind of Palestinian national identity um, in the, before the State of Israel was established. But that certainly wasn't um, all. That certainly wasn't a, a, a general national identity, right? The, the, the flag that we know of now as the Palestinian flag didn't exist until the 1960s or 70s, um, and as late as um, as late as 1948, when Israel is formed, um, there's still some sense that if Israel, if, let's put it this way, if the Arabs had won the war, if the Arabs had won the 48 war, and and the Jews had been driven out. Um, there's no, uh, there's certainly no guarantee that there would have been some separate independent Arab state called Palestine. It's just as likely that um, what was Palestine would have been split up um, into uh, parts of Syria, parts of Egypt, and parts of Jordan. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's a good point. See, if you make that case, if you make that case to anti-Zionists, they might say to you, well, um, it's subjective, right? If the Palestinians say that they feel that they have a national identity, if they claim that they feel they feel a national affinity with each other, then who are you to say that, they, um, that they're not a national group? Um, okay, maybe, but then why would that not apply to Jews, right? Who, who have, of course, as I said, um, had this national or peoplehood identity for, for millennia. Uh, right, it's not a, it's not a, um, it's, it's, it's by no, it's by, in no way is it, is it an argument that holds up um, to any kind of, to any kind of logic. Um, any other questions? Okay, right, so I'm gonna uh, thank you all for, um, 
for attending. Um, you know, every time I say that, someone writes a question. So I'm so here. So before I answer David Barron's question, I'm going to say my thank yous now. Um, I'm going to answer this this last question, um, assuming there are no more questions. Um, I'm going to also say I'm going to ask you to join next week when, as I said at the beginning, for those who missed it, we're going to be joined by Dan Mary Dor, uh, former Israeli government minister uh, in a number of governments, uh, talking about. Uh, Begin and Jabotinsky and the idea of liberal nationalism. Um, so that's going to be great. That's going to be next week at eight thirty, and you'll you'll uh, you can uh, uh, email me Paul G at BeginCenter.org.il uh, for the link, or I'll send. I'm going to send the link anyway to to those of you uh, whose whose contacts I have. Uh, it will also be on Facebook and on the website. Okay. Um, now I'm going to answer David Barons. He says, what about ethnic identity, in particular the case of Orban's Hungary, which have a similar number of ethnic Hungarians inside and outside Hungary as there are Jews inside and outside Israel? What is the case consistent with Zionism against his desire to preserve Hungary's uh, ethnic identity? That's a very, okay, fair question. So, all right, so, um, uh, so Hungary's not the only country, but certainly there are countries in Europe that would make that case, right, that would say, we want to have a nation state um, in which we protect the, uh, the national identity of our people, both inside and outside the country. I don't think that's inconsistent at all. I don't, I don't think, I have no problem with that. The problem with Orban and what he's doing in Hungary is not that he wants to preserve Hungary, Hungarian identity. It's that in doing so or in, or, or in pursuing that, he's making the claim that he needs to um, reduce the rights of other people, right? Or, or to chip away a Hungarian democracy. So he, so what Orban did over a number of years after becoming prime minister is to um, uh, remove the independence of the, of the Supreme Court, the judiciary, to um, chase out um, the uh, the me media. Um, media institutions that were critical of his party um, and to stuff the uh, electoral commission with supporters of his party. So he's established essentially a, um, a it's, it's, Hungary is still formally a democracy, but it's not a liberal democracy in any real sense because the, the judiciary doesn't have any power to check um, the power of the government or the, or the major or his majority in parliament. Uh, and there's no, and the, and the media is slavishly um, loyal to his, to his regime, and in recent weeks, he he's exploited the Corona um, situation to pass a to pass a law which gives him um, almost dictatorial powers in the parliament. So the issue with 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 Orbán in Hungary is is not that he wants to preserve Hungarian national identity; it's that um, those who are not Hungarian, or the, and in all those who are not uh, Hungarian and supportive of of him and his party. Um, are having their, their rights chipped away. That's the point. Um, that's why it's different from Israel, um, um, where um, fortunately um, we are not doing that. Um, so it's, uh, that, that's the issue with Hungary. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about Hungary or at least that tendency next week. Okay, I hope that answers your question, David. And um, thank you, everyone. I will see you, I hope, next week. And good evening or good afternoon. Hi, Ronnie. <laughs> Hi, Sheila and Moshe. All the way, for me, it's only 11.15.